Good afternoon. Um, for those that haven't joined us before, my name is Mark Stewart. I'm a director of RSK's geosciences business. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the latest in our Down to Earth webinar, which today has been given by Andy Fellows, who's going to give us a presentation on aspects of ground gas and soil vapour assessment and mitigation. Uh, first, I'd like to go through some brief housekeeping before we start. So. Um, all attendees' microphones are automatically muted, um, so we can't hear you, but you can hopefully hear us. Um, during the presentation, you can all post questions, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll answer as many questions as possible, but if we can't get around to them all, then we'll get back to you individually afterwards. Shortly after the webinar, you'll receive a link to a short survey. If you could take a few minutes to provide some feedback, that we'll be much grateful, and then we can improve future webinars. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Andrew Fellows, who's going to be presenting this afternoon. Andrew is a principal consultant based in our Himmel office in the Southeast. He specializes in risk assessment and is a sober accredited risk assessor for permanent gases and vapor intrusion. He's also the RSK Geosciences Technical Lead for Ground Gas and Vapor Intrusion, and he's responsible for our in upkeep of our upkeep of our internal guidance our technical reviews and of our training so over to you andy thanks very much mark it's a very kind introduction and thank you to everybody for attending um it's a pleasure to give the talk uh, what i'm going to do is turn my camera off so you can focus on the slides and the information provided and i'll switch it back on for the q a later So firstly, we're going to remind ourselves why the assessment of ground gas and vapour intrusion is important. It's 24th of March 1986 in Losco, Derbyshire. A sharp fall in atmospheric pressure results in the migration of methane from a landfill to a surrounding residential estates. Gas accumulates in the cellar of a house and a boiler pilot light ignited the gas resulting in an explosion that destroyed the house. Fortunately, nobody was killed. Indications of a gas hazard had been noted, comprising loss of grass and trees in nearby gardens, and also soil heating. But these were wrongly interpreted as a shallow burning coal seam. Had the site conditions been fully understood, this may have been avoided. A few years later, in 1988, the mining village of Arkwright was subject to methane seepage that was identified as a blue flame within someone's fireplace. Most of the village was subsequently found to be at risk from gas within shallow coal bands and had to be relocated. Such incidents in the 1980s led to an increase in the awareness of ground gas risk and to the Syria research programme that since provided us with a huge amount of guidance. However, further incidents have occurred more recently. The Gorebridge development in Midlovian was modern. It was built in 2007 to 2009 and had incorporated site investigation and ground gas risk assessment in accordance with good practice guidance at that time. However, in 2013, residents of New Beers Crescent reported difficulties with waking their children up, probably not normally uncommon, but also complained of headaches, dry coughs, dizziness and anxiety. They were subject to investigations by the local authority and the NHS that confirmed the presence of carbon dioxide associated with mine gas within some of the homes. The pathways for gas were subsequently found to include ungrounded mine shafts, natural fractures within bedrock, investigation boreholes that had not been decommissioned, and vibrostone columns that had been installed at the site. The incident management team recommended mandatory mine gas mitigation in all new developments over former mining areas. 
and the council incurred £12 million in costs for the investigation, rehousing of residents, demolition of homes and reconstruction of houses at another site that included gas protection measures. RSK are still involved in research for the Scottish Government on avoiding such incidents in future. But there's also issues related to volatile organic carbon and remediation of VOCs in soil is inevitably going to result in the release of chemicals to air. Remediation projects that have included former gas works and industrial sites has increased public awareness of such toxic hazards. In these examples, the monitoring of contaminants in outdoor air indicated no risk to public health and was heavily scrutinised by regulatory authorities. However, residents' concerns of ill health must be taken seriously. Local authorities are becoming aware of these issues and are now requesting consultants to include odour and short-term effects as part of their risk assessment process. So I'm briefly going to cover the current practices in ground gas investigation, largely informed not just by what RSK do, but also by our experience working with local authorities in reviewing submissions. So it's built on a wider understanding of the industry. Firstly, the land contamination risk management provides a framework for assessing land contamination for a variety of reasons, including liability assessment, sites developed under planning, and part way of the Environmental Protection Act. At each stage of the assessment process, the guidance provides examples related to the identification of sources, pathways and receptors for ground gas and volatile contaminants. And relevant guidance is also pointed out. Throughout Land Contamination Risk Management, or LCRM, is the requirement for those to have competency. So those undertaking the works must have sufficient training, knowledge and experience to undertake this work. Firstly, we look to identify sources. Gas generation in landfills is very much dependent on the type and age of material deposited and the landfill design. Risk to nearby receptors is dependent on site-specific conditions, such as landfill management and the surrounding geology. Typically, risk from gas within landfills decreases over time as the deposited waste materials degrade. The landfills can also act as a carrier for trace gases that can include volatile organic carbons. As we have seen, mine gas can also remain a risk to existing and new developments. Unflooded mine workings and the overlying geology, such as a fractured bedrock, can act as a reservoir of gas. Not all mine workings and shafts are recorded and may therefore constitute an unknown hazard at a site. Lower gas generation potential sources includes organic deposits such as alluvium, which can contain methane and carbon dioxide generated over geological timescales. The gas is typically trapped within these deposits and can be released when penetrated or disturbed. Typically, alluvium can be identified with high gas concentrations at low flow rates. Anthropogenic deposits such as made ground can also contain protressible material, high organic carbon content, and when of sufficient mass, could generate elevated concentrations of ground gas. Made ground can also be contaminated with volatile organic compounds and hydrocarbons, dependent on the historical site use. You must also consider receptors. Under planning, the most common reason for completing ground gas and vapour risk assessments is to support new build developments where receptors are introduced to a given site. 
However, existing receptors that may be impacted by proposed development activity also require consideration. Investigations of liability and under Part 2A of the Environmental Protection Act also commonly incorporate existing residential houses where protection measures may not have been considered at the time of construction. However, we do not have a risk if sources and receptors are not linked by pathways. Gas and vapours must migrate through the ground towards the property envelope. Ingress can then occur through numerous routes into the property and then accumulate to hazardous concentrations. Preferential pathways can also be present in underlying geology, such as fractures, or following site development, such as in utility bedding material, or from ground improvement techniques, such as vibrostone compaction. Throughout the assessment process, a conceptual model must be developed. Many are in tabular or text format, but drawings are helpful in identifying linkages and uncertainties. And a preliminary risk assessment is completed at the initial desk based stage and can be updated throughout the investigation and risk assessment process. Methane explosion and asphyxiation risk are severe consequences. VOC linkages are typically of medium consequence owing to their impact over chronic, uh, chronic concentrations, but acute risks can still occur. We must consider potential the data gaps at each stage and provide focus for follow-on investigations. Typically, when we investigate ground gas, we employ the installation of monitoring wells to support establishment of the site gas regime. However, field observations and laboratory analysis can provide critical lines of evidence to determine the gas generation potential of a particular source. When the engineer is on site, they must understand the conceptual site model and be prepared to vary well response zones and locations of monitoring wells as required. The implication is that monitoring data can be misleading if wells are installed correctly or when installed not in the correct response zone as required. Following installation of monitoring wells, we'll frequently undertake a monitoring program. The frequency of the monitoring program is largely dependent on what we know about the conceptual site model and the gas generation potential of the source. For low gas generation sources, monitoring is not always necessary, but can provide corroborative evidence that risks remain low. The monitoring program should account for variations in site conditions and try to capture worst case atmospheric conditions. For high gas generation sources, continuous monitoring is becoming a more common method for confirming the gas regime and for capturing worst case conditions over short time scales. In this example, we have methane concentrations peaking in our graph of 38% in line with a fall of atmospheric pressure that may have been missed during periodic monitoring. In this particular example, the peak occurred at a weekend and therefore would probably most likely have been missed. The other useful thing about continuous monitoring is it gives us a huge amount of data to work with, which can, which can support more advanced levels of risk assessment and design of mitigation. Commonly, Ground gas data is subject to review and we calculate hazardous gas flow rates for each borehole and for each monitoring event. This informs the selection of a gas screening value 
determined on the basis of the worst case gas concentrations identified and steady state flow rates. For most developments, the methodology set out in British Standard 8485 will apply. And for low rise housing, the NHBC traffic light guidance shown on the right is still commonly referenced. We must be careful that exceedance of typical concentration stated does not always indicate an unacceptable risk, but does mean we require to take further consideration. In this assessment, we must reflect on whether the site data aligns with the conceptual site model, and if other data or lines of evidence should be explored. And once we're confident of the gas regime, the point system adopted in the British Standard 8485 and the traffic light system adopted in the NHBC guidance provide simple methods to support engineers identify suitable mitigation methods. And we'll take a look at these a little bit later. Commonly, architects and structural engineers will set out the required ventilation, structural barriers, and membrane installation in development construction drawings, typically as advised by a membrane manufacturer or supplier. However, these measures still require design to confirm they are appropriate for the risk identified and the responsibility for specification of products and their installation rests with the designer. For higher risk sites that may be designated as CS4 or above, or NHBC red sites, may indicate that additional external remedial techniques may be appropriate. This can include direct remediation of gas generation sources, such as the reclamation of landfill materials, or pathway intervention, such as low permeability barriers or in-ground ventilation methods. And we're going to have a brief look at current VOC investigation practices and have a look at what some of the issues are. So VOC sources can be identified at death study stage and are commonly observed as tanks on historical maps, but specific site uses may not be fully identified. Walkovers could find no indication of tanks if the associated features, such as vent pipes, are demolished. We must also remember that off-site sources could impact the site, such as nearby dry cleaners, petrol stations or wider industry. Moving on to investigation, I will often find that sampling methods adopted typically follow a route of prioritisation as shown in the graphic. At each stage, the reliability of the data obtained in understanding actual soil vapour concentrations improves. In most exploratory site investigations, soil samples will be collected and analysed for VOCs for initial comparison to generic assessment criteria. This will be supported by field screening using PIDs, but this may not confirm the absence of a VOC source. For some constituents, soil vapour generic assessment criteria can be exceeded at what might be considered low PID readings, such as 1 ppm. There's other factors to consider when adopting generic assessment criteria for the vapour intrusion pathway. For example, biodegradation processes may be taking place, intrusion entry points may differ from that modelled, and the presence of NAPL may require a different type of assessment. Screening distances have been empirically demonstrated in the US for hydrocarbons and may be applicable in the UK for petroleum linkages, 
subject to the conceptual site model being appropriate. And we must always remember that the clear residential house, shown on the right, differs from that of the NHBC standard house in terms of foundation, being a ground bearing slab, as opposed to a beam and block floor, and also the absence of sub of subfloor ventilation. The use of detailed quantitative risk assessment can resolve these issues. That's not going to be a focus of the presentation today. Where we do need to undertake site-specific assessment, then an understanding of soil vapour concentrations is critically important. Therefore, soil vapour well installation and sampling for analysis is becoming more prevalent. Leakage testing is also advised to confirm that atmospheric entrainment is not occurring from the installed well. Laboratory analysis of canister or bottle vac samples can also include quantification of bulk gases to improve our understanding of shallow vapour as well as the ground gas conditions near to existing or proposed foundations. And in the field, continuous monitoring data can be collected from devices used for ground gas, such as gas flux or gas sentinel devices. And these can be backed up with vapour sampling for the speciation of VOCs. However, more refined technologies are available for assessing risk to indoor air. And this includes devices such as that with continuous TVOC monitoring and automated sampling developed by Ambisense, to site-based GCMS units developed by VaporSafe that can sample from multiple locations within an existing building, to handheld GCMS devices that can provide vapour speciation in real time. So we're going to talk about sampling soil for VOCs, as this remains a common and an important line of evidence in assessment. Obtaining reliable soil concentrations is also relevant to the assessment of controlled waters and to verify remedial works that may have taken place. So volatile contaminants in soil can be lost during sampling due to field methods, due to biological degradation in transport to laboratory and during laboratory procedures. Therefore, the reported concentrations in soil taken using traditional techniques may be lower than actual site concentrations by a significant margin. British Standard 10176 was published in 2020 and aims to improve sampling and handling protocol to improve the reliability of soil data collected. A range of commonly adopted investigation techniques are considered appropriate, provided that these have some method of obtaining a relatively undisturbed sample. However, it's recognised in the guidance that in each case, soils must have some cohesiveness, and therefore full adherence to the guidance cannot be, cannot be implemented for gravels and sands, and other techniques would need to be adopted. The guidance suggests various proprietary sampling methods that are available. These all comprise taking a small 5 to 25 gram subsample of soil that is either sealed as a core for direct transmission to laboratory or extruded into a jar containing a preservative. The guidance also suggests that adapted disposable syringes could also be used for this purpose. A number of laboratories are now offering this service and include provision of disposable and reusable sampling options as test kits. Typically, methanol preservative is preferred as this provides a 14 day holding time and appears to be one of the most practicable techniques to adopt in the field. We must remember, however, that methanol is flammable 
and toxic, and as an oxygenate is not appropriate for use in investigating petroleum losses. The British Standard 10176 method provides reliable concentrations with low limits of detection that can be below the current Category 4 screening levels of chlorinated solvents. The careful planning of sampling operations is required. And full adherence means there are QAQC procedures that, although they add to the scientific robustness of the project, they do increase the upfront cost. It is therefore normally preferable to target such techniques to VOC sources in cohesive soils that have been established through other lines of evidence. It is also possible to retain adherence to the British standard but using traditional techniques as long as it is justified that these are not applicable. So I'm just going to move on to some of the challenges that we face as practitioners when we're dealing with ground gas and VOC risk mitigation. Now VOCs can be directly remediated in soil and groundwater where an unacceptable risk is identified. But it's not always possible to remediate these substances to a finite degree. And sometimes there are residual risks following development where a vapour resistant membrane is commonly recommended. Fortunately, there is clear guidance on how such a membrane should be selected. Now for ground gas, the membrane industry is mature and a variety of membrane types for differing scenarios are available. Membrane selection should be based on resistance to the gases but also consider how readily a membrane will survive the construction process. Critical for VOCs is the ability to estimate the rate of permeation of vapour through a membrane and to confirm that indoor concentrations would remain below tolerable limits. Despite Syria guidance being in place for eight years, due to commercial sensitivities, laboratory data from manufacturers to allow the consultant to demonstrate suitability of a particular product in line with the guidance can be limited. But no matter how good a site investigation or DQRA may be at determining what is required, in the real world things do still go wrong. For example, there can be over conservatism in initial appraisals through the use of threshold concentrations and therefore unnecessary membrane installation can occur. And as we saw with Gorebridge, gas risk can materialize subject to changes to proposed developments. Furthermore, often there are issues with the use of incorrect membranes, membrane installation not being verified, or membranes being recommended but missed in construction. Typically, those detailing membranes will refer back to site investigation reports, which may not be an appropriate source. So the question is, well, how can we overcome these issues? Well, firstly, the answer is already within the British standard. Design reports are an essential part of the British standard but do not appear in RSK's experience to be routinely prepared. A design report allows for the consultant to reappraise the site at detailed design stage and to work with the wider design team to ensure that mitigation measures are appropriate. There may be a requirement to vary or adjust measures indicated in site investigation reports. The report also allows for regulatory approval of the measures proposed and provides a single point of reference for the client, designers and contractors over the scope of measures.
and for vapour impacted developments. The design reports will need to justify that the membrane and other measures will adequately reduce vapour concentrations within the proposed property. It may also be reasonable to consider the potential risk should the membrane fail during the life of the development and therefore the design would need to allow for some level of redundancy. The report must be prepared by a competent person as indicated by appropriate qualifications and experience such as an ASOBRA professional or a chartered engineer. However, regardless of how good the investigation and design process is, without verification, it is not possible to be confident that the system has been put in place and will work as intended. A verification plan should be prepared by a competent consultant and be cognizant of the gas regime, design complexity, the development size, and the competency of the proposed installer. Verification should be undertaken by an independent organisation that are not involved in the construction process. It is common for installers to offer to subcontract verification. However, there can be perceived conflicts of interest and limitations. For example, the verification may not include all elements of the gas protection system. Verification reports may not meet planning requirements and the verifier may not be aware of background reports and site-specific requirements, such as zoning of membranes or different types of membrane required at different parts of the site. RSK therefore commonly recommend that the verifier is directly appointed by the developer and works to an independently produced verification plan. But there is further guidance available. In January was issued the Syria C801 document and it's intended to support the construction industry with this process. The document is a necessary reference point for developers during project planning and construction and includes consideration of many of the issues covered in this presentation. Thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions and answers now. Thank you, Andrew. That was a really interesting talk. So we've got a couple of questions that come in, three or four questions that come in now. Um, we'll kick off with how useful is soil vapour sampling to exploratory investigations for housing developments? Soil vapour sampling. So with soil vapour sampling, you would install a, a fairly bespoke soil vapour sampling well, um, fairly shallow. Um, and that would give you a, a small response zone and a port, if you like, in which to take representative soil vapour samples. I would say for a, a residential development with a death study that confirms a potential VOC source and um, other site information such as odours or PID headspace results that indicate that there is uh, potential vapours in, in soil or in underlying groundwater, then I would say it's pretty useful. Um, from an early stage, it's it's really helpful to understand what that uh, vapour concentration is in the soil, and it's useful to measure that vapour concentration over time and over different site conditions. So it's very helpful to get that information at the exploratory stage, um, so that we understand and we can advise the developer what they may need to do. Okay. Um, so we've got time. If anyone wants to send in any more questions, please do so now. Um, we go to the next one. Does publication of BS 10176 mean we no longer need to take samples in the traditional way? Well, the, the British standard um, does obviously promote uh, the use of preservatives, um, the use of these particular methods for obtaining samples, but it is understood within the guidance that you can only really do some of these methods in cohesive soils. 
So it is important that where we're dealing with made ground that may be more granular, where we're dealing with uh, impacted terrace deposits that would largely be sands and gravels, that it may be, there may be no other choice but to take samples in the traditional way of um, plopping that material into a pot and sending it to the lab. Um, however, it is allowed and it should be considered that all measures should be taken um, to reduce the loss of volatiles. So, for example, um, you can make sure the person taking the samples is fully trained in how to do so and not leave headspace within the jar. Um, you could also take the samples still using the approved methodologies. And you can take the samples using um, uh, on, a, on a quick turnaround at the laboratory to make to reduce the time at which those samples are tested and you get the results back much quicker. Okay, um, next one. Do uh, local planning authorities require verification reports or design reports in order to get planning permission or is it a requirement of the house builders or developers once permission has been granted? Well, usually, usually conditions will follow Planning conditions that are granted will, will follow um, the usual steps of a, a desk study, a site investigation, a remediation strategy um, and verification. Um, but it is important that the measures that are proposed within the development are proven to be effective and that the design is suitable for the risk. Um, and therefore, it's it's helpful in many instances to have the regulator involved um, in reviewing those documents and making sure you've got their buy-in for those design reports. Um, there may not be a, a necessarily a, a strict requirement within a planning condition that that is issued, but it, I'd consider it would be good practice that that is reviewed by the regulator. Quite often it's worded, isn't it? They should be agreed in advance. That's correct, and, um, and yeah. also building control. would we'll be interested in in seeing the full design. Having it, having that in one place, uh, makes it very easy for anyone who's interested to uh, um, to uh, to see what's proposed at the site and, and check for themselves what's going in. Well, it's best to get things agreed early, earlier than later. Um, so the next one: Can soil gas concentration obtained by a passive sampling be used to calculate intrusion risk in case? You know the uptake rate of the samplers. Um, so you're thinking of, um, I presume you're thinking of passive desorption tubes. Um, um, yes, there, I don't think there'd be any reason not to use those techniques. Um, and I have heard of those techniques being used. I haven't used them myself, um, but I would be surprised if, provided you know the rate of absorption, you know the length of time that this unit is in place. That you couldn't then get a, a, a reasonable uh, understanding of the uh, the concentration in vapor from that those sorts of devices. And um, finally, uh, what are your thoughts regarding visual checks carried out on gas membranes? That's an interesting question. Um, I speak quite a lot with my colleague uh, Chris Larkin, who leads our verification team, um, and the issue with um, you know, visual checks is. For, for most instances, um, you know, you're very much dependent on the training and the attention paid by the verifier. Um, quite often you would need to do a mechanical test as well of the seams and seals. Um, and they're a useful first line of information. Um, I think it's unlikely that for most instances you'd need to do um, any particular verification um, that may be more complicated. Um, such as air lance testing or dielectric testing on on, um, on all instances. Um, but um, yes, I think as long as it's done carefully, um, as long as there's clear communication between the verifier and the installers and the client as over any defects that are identified, then it's, um, it's a pretty effective process. Um, in our experience, regardless of how ex uh, experienced and qualified the installers are, um, there's almost always going to be some defects identified. It's just uh, the nature of construction. Okay, one more comment. Um, yeah, oh, one more has just come in actually. 
what other requirements to be um, what other requirements to be a certified consultant to be a certified consultant um, well generally consultants just need to be um, suitably experienced trained um, they need to have certain qualifications um, and ideally you know a consultant will be chartered um, and there's other qualifications for things like the verification for example or, or the people designing measures RSK are in support of the, the Clare um, gas um, verification program um, which provides assurance to clients that those that they are procuring to do this sort of work are suitably trained and assessed as competent um, to uh, to provide advice on the design of, of mitigation measures um, as well as the uh, ins installation and inspection. Okay. I was going to finish but we've still got questions coming in. So uh, do you do you use Claire's gas protection verification accredi accreditation scheme at all? Um, yeah, that's the scheme I just mentioned. Um, so we've currently got, um, obviously that's quite new. Um, we've currently got staff who are uh, who are progressing through that um, and preparing their submissions. Um, I think it's a very useful scheme. Um, it'll take a while to get lots of people signed on to it because there's there's a reasonable amount of um, documentation required. For example, you need to uh, to, to demonstrate that you've um, designed protection measures and approved you know, protection measures and verification plans and then also um, that you've provided the, the verification report um, following inspections and so on so um, yeah but yeah it's, it's a, it sounds like a really good scheme and it's something that uh, RSK support. Okay so um, yeah thanks Angie for answering those. Um, We've had um, well over 140 attendees today, so that's a really good number. And this presentation will be on our uh, YouTube page shortly afterwards. Um, so thank you all for attending. Our next webinar on the 8th of March, uh, for that we'll be joined by Leap Environmental, who are a fellow RSK group company. And um, they'll be presenting on water monitoring to support nutrient neutrality for large-scale housing developments. So I hope you can all join us again. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day.